Dr. David Reese is joining us from San Diego. He's a psychiatrist over 30 years of experience treating people of all backgrounds and conditions. He's been recognized internationally for his expertise in character and personality dynamics. He also treats patients with suspected CTE and has been a wonderful resource for us as we launched the CLF helpline. So we're grateful to have him with us today. Hello, Dr. Reese, and then thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, and it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I've been a psychiatrist for quite a while. Actually, my first connection with sports medicine was with the Northwestern football team during my residency, and that goes back to 1978. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's already spoken for the important information, the heartfelt, you know, personal stories that have been shared. And I'm going to make my presentation a bit briefer and a, a more focused. Uh, basically, what I'd like to talk about is demystifying what it means to have a good interaction and good treatment with a shrink. Um, and this is starting from the point that someone's willing to come in and that in itself isn't easy. Um, yeah, so uh, basically, you know, when you come in to see a psychiatrist, what do we have to look at? Well, when we're dealing with problems like this, we have to realize that we're not dealing with just a disorder. Depression may be experienced similarly by different people, but means very different things, as different causes and different treatments. And I want to focus particularly on how it's different to provide evaluation and treatment when you're dealing with someone who has had head injury, uh, whether it be acute or chronic. Uh, first, we're, we're obviously looking at the neuropsychological factors, which is that Injury to the brain can cause disruptions of being able to function emotionally. Uh, very simple to understand, very difficult to really appreciate on a biochemical level uh, and on a treatment level. That's not to say there isn't treatment, but we know a heck of a lot more than we did 40 years ago when I first started this, but we have a long way to go. But we all have, always have to be aware that an aspect of what we're seeing is not just who the person is, but that they have a neurological, physiological issue that's impacting how they're functioning emotionally. Now, what does that mean to the psychological responses to the people have, that people have to their injury? Not just the physiological, but what are they experiencing that can make the depression worse? First of all, obviously confusion. What's happening to me? What's going to happen to me? What's gonna to happen to my family? Um, despite whatever's going on neurologically, those worries and fears of themselves cause a lot of anxiety and depression, as well as just practical disruptions. Practical disruptions, and it may be in a limited portion of someone's life, but it may be in, a, in multiple significant areas and that these disruptions are more related to the injury, but they foster the depression. And the depression that you get from disruptions of functioning combined with the physiological depression, making it, that's why so many people have so many different diagnoses, because at different times, different things predominate. I don't treat diagnoses, I don't treat neurotransmitters, I treat people. And what do people have? Well, they have family. They have friends, they have relationships, all of which can be affected by depression, but all of which may have problems of different types that cause depression, and all of which can be affected by the effects of head injury, cognitive problems, loss of functioning. Beyond functioning with family, friends, relationships, significant others, obviously, can I work? Can I function in the workplace? Can I interact? Can I? do what I need to do cognitively, interpersonally, that in itself can cause depression, especially going from someone who was previously high functioning, highly rewarded for what they're doing, who now is lost as to what they're going to do and can they even do it effectively. Also important and often overlooked is, can I still have fun? Can I still enjoy myself? Can I still participate 
in things that, that are safe and reasonable and give me some pleasure. A lot of times there are impairments that get in the way with that. People who don't have the cognitive abilities to, let's say, play poker as well as they used to, uh, or they're afraid to meet with friends because their friends may see that they're limited. So there are disruptions in the ability to have fun that relate back to the neurological impairment, but of itself cause depression. And of course, with that is also just physical activity in general from just going places, being able to ambulate, being able to travel, uh, being able to participate in whatever activities that involve physical action that may no longer come as easily and certainly not on the same level. Now this looks like a jumble. Well, it is a jumble because every person we see is a unique individual. And that's why you don't treat the diagnosis, you treat the person. Particularly when we're dealing with, with people who've had head injury, and that's what I really want to focus on very narrowly. The first thing is the nature of the injury. Sometimes we understand it neurologically, a lot of times we don't, but just on these graphic pictures, obviously, the injury can occur in multiple different ways and lead to multiple different problems within the brain. That's not my expertise. I'm talking to neurologists and neuropsychologists about that, but we have to realize that every individual is different in that way in the nature of the injury they've suffered on a physical basis, as well as the trauma that was involved in the injury itself, which is a whole different issue I won't go into in detail, but the whole issue of PTSD that may be related to the injury that occurred. Then you go to, well, what about who the person was before they were injured? Now, these days that we know enough to ask, we're often finding, I can't tell you how many people are admitted to psych hospitals, whether it be for depression or substance abuse, and no one ever asked them. They may have asked, have you had a TBI? But they've never asked, did you play ball in school? You know, were you an athlete? Were you a victim of domestic violence? So these are all issues that relate to who someone was before the injury, that then the injury becomes part of it. It may not be the whole story, but it surely all interacts. Uh, the first is just we each have our own unique neurochemistry. I'm not going to go into the details, but we all react differently to different physical, physiological, medical, dietary input. So we always have to be aware of that, even if we don't totally understand it, be aware that that's an issue. Very important is just our own innate temperament and personality. You know, is this someone who previously was always happy or always sad or tended to be moody or tended to be sociopathic or tended to have different types of obsessive compulsive personality traits? I mean, let's face it, I mean, let's see, Unless you're seven foot four and 400 pounds, unless you're pretty obsessive, you're not going to make it in the NFL. So you have a lot of issues of just basic temperament and basic personality traits that are now either dulled or exacerbated and made more prominent because of the physical injury. But we can't ignore that that was an issue before. Maybe it was never even identified or was actually very adaptive but it's still something we have to always take into account as interacting. And then you just have, we each have our own personal lives. I mean, no matter how much someone's devoted to sports, there are other things going on in your life. I don't have to enumerate all of this, as well as important events. Um, some people have had very exciting things happen in their life. They've had great lives. They, they're used to things going well, and things not going well becomes a problem in itself psychologically because that sense that I'm sort of immune suddenly disappears and suddenly I'm very vulnerable. I'm not immune to the other side of people who've had different types of traumas, abuse, uh, traumas that someone was responsible for, not responsible for, um, but people who have learned to defend themselves in certain ways because of past traumas. You add to this all the ongoing stresses and how the neurologically, neurological impairment affects the ability to cope with all of this. And again, we're in a very different environment, 
treatment rises to what we're looking at, how to understand it, and what to do with it. Um, obviously, there are really basically two modalities that we have for treatment. And again, I'm going to just go very superficially into some of the good parts and pitfalls of what this has to offer people with emotional problems post head injury. This counseling, whether it be individual counseling, and there are multiple different types and different theories, and I won't go into that right now. Uh, group counseling, peer counseling also can be very useful. But basically, this is identifying and talking about your problem and seeking solutions with one or multiple other people, at times family sessions involving significant others. But I'm just gonna leave that as a group in terms of counseling. And then the other side, of course, we have meds. And we have a whole bunch of meds, none of which are perfect, all of which have potential pitfalls, and particularly some pitfalls in people who oppose head injury. So just going back here, we have two things which first of all have to be integrated. If you have a counselor talking to you and a shrink throwing meds at you here, and there's no interaction here, that just is not good treatment because, if you, because they each affect each other. And if you're not understanding what's going on on both sides, you're not treating the whole person. So what are the good and bad parts of counseling? Well, obviously, hopefully a person Oops, I've lost my slideshow. Let me go back here. Ah, sorry. Hopefully, a person gains some understanding just of what's going on with them, becomes less frightened, and even if it isn't good, becomes more realistic. The most important issue is a gaining of trust with the people you're talking with, be it an individual or be it a group. That's why peer counseling is so important often to start to introduce someone to be able to talk where they feel comfortable. Uh, and often in therapy, you know, the first six months of, uh, or a year is doing nothing but relating on the basis to gain someone's trust. And you know, a lot of times docs will, you know, if, if you're not responding in three or four weeks, well, let's try something different. Sometimes it takes six months, a year to gain the trust to even begin active treatment, that's really gonna be effective. Because just like any good coach can talk, teach you all the techniques all you want, you can practice all the techniques all day long and become fantastic at it. If you don't trust the coach, if you don't trust your teammates, what good are the techniques gonna do? So the main issue in treatment is establishing trust, leading to hopefully comfort, basically feeling better about oneself, less anxiety, less depression, et cetera. But let's just call it comfort without going to specifics of diagnosis. Now, what can go wrong, particularly with people who've suffered head injuries? This may not be very easy, trying to understand. I mean, I've had people I see who understand perfectly what I'm talking about in the session, but by the time they leave, they can't really remember it, or they can't really internalize it or integrate it. So the downside of helping people to understand is realizing when you may be actually creating more confusion and how you have to really go very carefully in introducing the understanding at a level that it can be understood, accepted and integrated, not leading to paradoxically more anxiety and depression by sowing confusion. Um, again, most importantly, the downside of trust is suspiciousness. You know, if you're seeing someone that you just don't feel comfortable with, you know, if I'm going into surgery, I really don't care if the surgeon is an a-hole. I just want him or her to do a good job. But in treatment, you need to have a personal relationship. If you're not comfortable with that, all the suspiciousness that comes out of the neurological confusion and the neurological suspiciousness of not being able to attend to things or react to things like you used to be able to do. That's all heightened within interpersonal relationships, at home, with family, with parents, children, significant others. And if it's happening in therapy, you have to be careful you're not making things worse and back off to reestablish moving towards trust. The other thing that's very normal in therapy, but it's uncomfortable and that we 
saw here today very movingly is that it brings out grief. Uh, I'm not going to say more about that, but that therapy isn't fun. Uh, yes, there are times they can be joking, there are times it's enjoyable, but at times it's very, very painful. And someone has to have a lot of courage to be there. And the therapist has to understand and respect that courage and know how far to go, how quickly to go, and when to back off. In terms of medications, I'm just gonna sum this up very briefly. We have a whole bunch of different medications. As I said, none are perfect. But what most, and basically the idea is to use the medication to improve your mood and all the, the other effects, sleep, appetite, concentration, that are affected by the depression itself. What often isn't realized is that these medications work somewhat differently in people who have cognitive problems, head injuries, for both physiological and psychological reasons. First of all, when we're dealing with athletes, we're dealing with people who are used to living an active lifestyle, in plain language, like living on the adrenaline. So just the sense of being flat, being unable to be excited, being unable to participate in itself, no medication is gonna cure that. In fact, at times it can make things worse. So when medication works well, yes, whether it be through dopamine or this or that, it can help to improve mood. It can help the physiological aspects of the depression. Sometimes a stimulant is actually even better than an antidepressant, using something different to sleep, using something for nightmares or paranoia, all significant issues. But what we have to be careful for is, again, particularly in people who already are dealing with some cognitive impairment, that a side effect of many of the antidepressants and anti-anxieties we, medications we use is mild cognitive impairment. Often it's so mild people don't notice it or they feel it's worth the trade-off for not feeling depressed. But take someone who's already struggling cognitively and take another 5% off by the effects of the medication and you may have made things significantly worse. Along with that, just over sedation. You know, people, yes, yeah, some people will crave just wanting to be sort of asleep all the time, but for, that's no good. That's not a good way to live. That's not really treatment. And a lot of times it makes the depression worse. Sometimes the medications, rather than calming, since they do try to lift up mood, will lead to agitation. And that is much more common in people who have any type of brain dysfunction, where just rather than triggering a safe activation, it triggers agitation. Often we'll see people, just more medications added to medicate the effects of the other medication. My view is best to start from scratch, look at what's going on and evaluate something different. And I'll end with the last area, which is something that, that really, I, I think is very much underappreciated is most of the antidepressants we have, the SSRIs, the SNRIs, they're pretty good not perfect, but pretty good at dealing with depression. But one of the significant side effects is they sort of dull people in general. You know, sometimes it's very mild, sometimes it's more pronounced, but people describe it as, I feel better, but it's like a wet blanket is thrown over me. You know, I, I'll have people who've never gone to a casino before playing penny slots just to try to get themselves excited. Now that's your average person that, you, that I'm seeing for different reasons. You take your athlete who's used to living on adrenaline, who's used to being on the edge, who wants that excitement, and suddenly everything they would normally do, even what they still can do for excitement, is boring, gets them nowhere. You can get to a real vicious cycle of increased impulsivity to try to bring back the ability to be excited. So again, that also has to be dealt with in therapy. What else can you do? What can you safely do? So in summary, everything needs to be integrated. You need the therapy, medication. You need a doctor who's seeing you as a person. And with that, no, we don't know of a cure for depression any more than we know of a cure for CTE, but it surely can be helpful. And there's really nothing mysterious about the process. Complicated, yes. Frustrating, often, but mysterious or scary, it doesn't have to be. Thank you.